Welcome to the, the fall semester and the continuation of the U.S. Foreign Policy Series hosted here at the Institute for International Studies. My name is Neil Jock. I'm the host of this series along with my colleague Daniel Sargent, who's a professor in history department. He's not here today, but we will have a series of talks this term as well as next term. Let me just draw your attention in addition to today's talk. We thought it would be good to have sort of contrasting views in a certain sense. So today we'll be hearing from Matt Kranig uh, to talk about the Iran deal. So later in the September, on September 28th, we'll have George Perkovich from the Carnegie Endowment for International uh, Policy at, um, in Washington, who will give a, a similar talk, but from a different perspective. So we're gonna try and give the full, the full story, if you will. Um, later this month, we also have a talk by Dr. Julia Swig on the United States and Cuba, recent history and the path forward. That will be in Valley Life Science Building on September 17. Also, I'm reading from this poster, so you can pick these up as you exit if you'd like to attend other of the talks. After Julia's talk, we'll then have George Perkovich, as I said, on uh, the 28th of September. After that, Dr. Matt Spence, Turmoil and Opportunities in the Middle East. Matt is currently the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Middle East Policy. And then toward the end of the term on October 22nd, partly to mark the 70th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations in San Francisco on October 24, we'll have Ambassador Rosemary DiCarlo, who has been the U.S. Deputy Permanent Representative of the United Nations for several years before her retirement last year. She worked under both current Ambassador Samantha Power as well as Susan Rice, who was the uh, U.S. Ambassador prior to Samantha taking over. So um, I'll try and be brief again. My name is Neil Jock. Our, our guest today is Matt uh, Kranig. It's a homecoming for Matt. He was a graduate student here at UC Berkeley. He completed his PhD in um, political science. He's one of these uh, rare and capable scholars who turned his PhD dissertation into a very interesting and very um, commendable book called Exporting the Bomb, Technology Transfer and the Spread of Nuclear Weapons, which I recommend to you. He's also more recently published a book on the Iran deal, on the challenge uh, as he sees it from, from Iran. Uh, he's currently an associate professor at uh, Georgetown University. Previously, he was at the Belfer Center at Harvard. Um, a, a range of accomplishments for someone who's fairly freshly minted PhD uh, out of Berkeley. So please join me in welcoming Matt Kranig back to Berkeley. Thanks a lot, Neil. Great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Neil. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here in Berkeley. As Neil said, I did my PhD here. Uh, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of memories walking around campus today. I had an apartment down on college in Derby for about six years. Uh, wrote large parts of my dissertation just uh, on a desk uh, where I think Rexel has, has her office now, uh, just here in Moses. Uh, so really good to be back, and uh, really good to be hosted by, by Neil, who, uh, while I was here at Berkeley, was one of my mentors. You know, there aren't that many uh, people interested in, in national security and foreign policy in Berkeley compared to you know, Washington, D.C., or other places. Uh, so it was great to have Neil to, to serve as a mentor. Um, and it's great to see uh, all of you here today. We didn't know at the beginning of the semester how many people would, would turn up, uh, so it's great to see such a large turnout. Uh, I would like to think it's because of me, but I know it's because this is such uh, an important and, and timely issue. Uh, so I'm happy to talk to you about it today. Uh, so I think what I'll do in my talk is, I think I'll actually divide it in, in four parts. I think first I'll talk a little bit about kind of the history of the Iranian nuclear program and of U.S. foreign policy towards Iran mm -hmm. to uh, explain uh, how we got to this point. Second, I'll talk about this deal, uh, what's in the deal, what's not in the deal. Uh, third, I'll make what I think is the, the best case uh, one can make for the deal. And then fourth, I'll make the case against it. Uh, and um, to foreshadow where I'm going a little bit, you know, it's um, all foreign policy challenges are, are really choices between bad options. And I think that's where we, we stand today. We have a choice between bad options. Uh, so different people, reasonable people have different views of which set of risks they'd rather r run, what their priorities are. Uh, but, but my judgment is that um, this, this is a weak deal and that there is uh, a better alternative. Uh, so that's where I'm, I'm headed. Uh, so first, what, uh, what should we know about uh, the history of the Iranian nuclear program and about uh, US foreign policy towards it? Well, I know when you, you start to talk about the Iranian nuclear deal and the Iranian nuclear issue, for some people, it just seems very complicated very quickly. 
numbers of centrifuges and levels of enriched uranium and uh, you know, the inspections. Is it going to be 24 days or is it going to be uh, less than four days? How quickly can they get access? And so I think a lot of people probably hear these details and, and zone out. Um, but I think actually the, the fundamental issues here are, are pretty simple, and I hope that that comes through over the next uh, 30 minutes or so. And the first thing that I think is, is important to understand is that from the beginning of the nuclear era, uh, scientists in the United States uh, understood that nuclear fuel making, uh, in particular uranium enrichment technology and plutonium reprocessing technology, was a dual use uh, technology. That as soon as you can make nuclear fuel for reactors, uh, you can also make nuclear fuel for nuclear weapons. And so really U.S. nonproliferation policy going back, um, you know, I would argue, to the 1940s has essentially been to try to square that circle. It's always been uncomfortable. There's always been tension. But the way the U.S. has tried to square the circle is to uh, say that countries can have peaceful nuclear technology. The United States has even encouraged, encouraged the use of peaceful nuclear technology, uh, meaning research reactors and power reactors. Uh, but to discourage and prevent the fuel making. Um, because again, once you can enrich uranium or once you can reprocess plutonium, you have the ability to make fuel also for, for nuclear weapons. So the vast majority of countries on Earth that have peaceful nuclear programs don't enrich their own uranium, they don't reprocess their own plutonium, they have fuel provided to them by a more advanced nuclear power, they run the fuel in the reactors and ship it out. Um, so that's just an important point to, to understand up front. Uh, so how did Iran's nuclear program begin? Well, it began really with U.S. help under Eisenhower's Adams for Peace program in the 1950s. Uh, so um, again, an attempt to square the circle, the Adams for Peace program was to uh, an attempt to promote peaceful nuclear technology, uh, but at the same time discouraging fuel making. Uh, so in the 1950s, Iran signed up for Adams for Peace. It, uh, the United States helped build the Tehran Research Reactor, uh, still in operation in Tehran. Uh, and this is, of course, under the Shah. The United States and the Shah had, had much better relations uh, than the, with the current government. And so the United States and Iran negotiated, um, well, cooperated, and then uh, were working towards a bigger nuclear deal throughout the 1970s. Uh, the United States was considering providing up to six or, or eight uh, nuclear power reactors to Iran. Uh, but that cooperation, of course, uh, collapsed with the revolution. Uh, the Iranian Revolution, the, the Shah was out, uh, the new Supreme Leader came in, established the Islamic Republic, uh, and U.S.-Iranian relations took a turn for the worse. Uh, this nuclear cooperation came to a halt. Uh, and the new uh, Supreme Leader, the first Supreme Leader of Iran, wasn't that interested in nuclear uh, technology. He actually himself canceled some of these nuclear cooperation agreements with European powers uh, and, and said that he wasn't that interested. But over the course of 1980s, he would, he would change his mind. Because as you know, in the 1980s, there was one of the most devastating wars of the 21st century, or the 20th century, the uh, Iran-Iraq War. Uh, and in the Iran-Iraq War, Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons uh, against Iranian forces. Uh, and so it was during this time that uh, the Iranian Supreme Leader changed his mind uh, about nuclear issues. And in fact, in a letter to supporters uh, in the late 1980s, uh, he decided he had to sign a ceasefire with Saddam Hussein um, and uh, wrote a letter to his supporters to explain this decision. And he said this was a difficult decision. Uh, he likened it to drinking from a poisoned chalice. It was so difficult to sign a peace treaty with Saddam Hussein. Uh, but then later in the letter, he said he looked forward to resuming the war in the future uh, with nuclear weapons that will be the, the necessity of warfare at that time. Uh, so the late 1980s, first clear statement from Iranian leader of an interest in, in nuclear weapons. Uh, so at about this time, representatives from Iran met with A.Q. Khan. Uh, so some of you may remember hearing about A.Q. Khan. He was in the news uh, 10 or 15 years or so ago. Um, so A.Q. Khan was this Pakistani nuclear scientist who provided basically do-it-yourself atomic bomb kits to Iran, Libya, and North Korea. Uh, and so A.Q. Khan provided Iran with uh, centrifuge designs, basic component parts for centrifuges. And uh, we think, but we're not certain that he might have also provided nuclear weapons designs. Uh, so that was the beginning of Iran's current enrichment program. Um, I should point out that you know, Neil has a long and distinguished uh, career in, in US foreign policy. And uh, one of the things he, he, he did over the course of his career at one point had the opportunity to meet A.Q. Khan, uh, this Pakistani. And I think you have a photo of, of you and A.Q. Khan together. So um, maybe you, in Q&A, you can share your reflections on. Uh, it's your show, man. OK. <laughs> um, but so Iran's uh, enrichment program began in the late 1980s. And throughout the 1990s, the United States suspected that Iran might have um, uh, ambitions for a larger nuclear program because we 
kind of suspicious procurement patterns and technologies they were buying. Uh, but really, the current crisis started in 2002. Uh, when an Iranian dissident group announced that Iran was building the secret uh, uranium enrichment facility at Natanz. Uh, and so that was the beginning of, of the current crisis. So since uh, 2002, uh, the United States and Iran have been, um, you know, at, really Iran and the international community have been at loggerheads over this enrichment program. And so as I pointed out, U.S. Non nonproliferation policy has always been to, to prevent enrichment uh, technologies, e spread of enrichment technologies, even to some of our closest uh, partners. Uh, so in the 1970s, for example, uh, South Korea and Taiwan, uh, U.S. allies, had reprocessing programs, this other kind of sensitive fuel making capability. Uh, and the United States sat down on them and hard and said, this is unacceptable. You need to shut these programs down. Uh, you know, essentially choose between having good relations with the United States or having these sensitive nuclear technologies. And so both countries agreed to give up uh, enrichment reprocessing. Um, in fact, one uh, one Taiwanese scientist at, at the time said, when, when the Americans got through with us, I'm surprised we're still allowed to teach physics on Taiwan. <laughs> um, uh, so when it was announced that Iran had an enrichment program, uh, America's uh, policy kind of, uh, as you might expect, given this history, was to say, uh, this is unacceptable. Iran uh, is, should not be allowed to enrich uranium. It needs to get rid of this enrichment program. Uh, and so um, over the course of the next several years, then the United States tried to, to build support for this position. Uh, in the end, we got uh, the first UN Security Council resolution in 2006 uh, demanding that Iran suspend its enrichment program. Uh, over the years, we'd get uh, five subsequent UN Security Council resolutions demanding that Iran suspend its enrichment program. Uh, but over time, as Iran's program grew, uh, more and more people, I think, became skeptical that we'd get Iran to give up enrichment completely. Uh, and so in 2000 and uh, late, let's see, was it? Uh, late 2013, uh, we signed this interim nuclear deal with Iran. Um, there's a lot of background. It's a, a high-level uh, overview here, um, in part because the international community in these UN Security Council resolutions and through other measures had put really uh, intense economic sanctions in place against Iran. And so the, uh, there's kind of a conventional wisdom among IR scholars that economic sanctions don't work. But I think there's a good case to be made that these were the most successful economic sanctions ever constructed in, in history. Um, and especially in 2012, because in early 2012, uh, the EU oil embargo went into place. So Iran, of course, is a major oil exporter. The Europeans were a major market. Uh, the EU put in place an oil embargo, which really hurt. And then also in 2012, Iran was kicked out of this SWIFT banking system. Uh, SWIFT um, uh, is an organization that kind of is a clearinghouse for international banking transactions located in Belgium, and Iran was kicked out, so basically kicked out of the international banking system. Uh, so this, you know, we'd had sanctions in place since 2006 or so, but 2012, the really tough sanctions kicked in. Uh, by 2013, they were having a major effect. A country that had been growing at a few percentage points a year was in, was in recession. These sanctions put it into a recession. Uh, changed Iranian domestic politics, in part to get out from under these uh, sanctions. Um, the Supreme Leader allowed uh, this President Rouhani, a more moderate, um, and we can discuss what, what that means uh, later, but, uh, but more moderate anyway than Ahmadinejad and some of the other candidates, uh, and was elected on a platform basically of getting sanctions relief. Uh, so started negotiations just a few months later, we got this interim deal. Um, but what this interim deal did, this was the United States came down off this long-standing position of zero enrichment, zero reprocessing. Uh, the interim deal acknowledged that Iran uh, would have some kind of enrichment program. And then so over the past 18 months, what we've been doing is really engaging in the unprecedented act of negotiating over the size and scale of an enrichment program uh, in a country of, of proliferation uh, concern. Uh, so that brings us up to, to the deal that uh, was announced recently and that it looks like, as of yesterday, uh, the administration has enough votes in Congress to override any, any veto. Uh, so what does the deal do? Uh, kind of bringing us to the second part of the talk. Um, well, I've heard uh, administration officials uh, give this talk a number of times of what the deal does, so I'll um, do my best to kind of channel, channel them uh, to just you know, kind of provide the facts first before going in, into the analysis. Um, so the first thing they would say is this cuts off all of Iran's possible pathways to the bomb. Uh, because yes, we allow them to keep enrichment capability, 
Uh, but we've negotiated strict limits on the numbers of centrifuges, the levels at which they can enrich, uh, the number of, um, of enrichment facilities. Uh, we've also gotten them to repurpose this heavy water reactor at Iraq, ARAK, which is really great for producing large amounts of, of plutonium that could later be reprocessed for nuclear weapons. Um, so uh, we put these strict limits on the program. Uh, the best estimates are today that if Iran's supreme leader decided today, so this is a conditional point, if, if the, the supreme leader decided today that he was going to dash to a nuclear weapons capability, basically enrich as much uranium uh, as quickly as possible, as much as possible, uh, that he could have uh, enough material, uh, enough highly enriched uranium, weapons grade uranium for his first nuclear weapon in two to three months. Uh, so we're, we're pretty close. Uh, what this deal will do is extend that timeline. Uh, so the administration claims that this will extend that timeline to about 12 months. Uh, so with the restrictions from this deal in place, if Iran decided to dash to a nuclear weapons capability, it would take it about a year. Uh, some outside experts who have looked at this, uh, Ali Heinonen, who used to have the Iran file at the IEA, is currently at Harvard, has looked at this and said, well, it's probably not 12 months, maybe it's more like eight months. Uh, but in any case, it's, it's clear that what this deal will do with these restrictions will kind of uh, draw out Iran's so-called dash time or breakout time, how long it would take it to dash. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, but you might be asking, well, what if Iran tries to cheat? Uh, how are we going to know if it is actually abiding by these limits or not? Uh, and so what the administration uh, argues is, well, we have one of the most, I think they argue, the most intrusive nuclear inspections regime ever created. Uh, I think that's uh, somewhat debatable, but it is um, clearly uh, intrusive. Uh, so what this inspections regime will do, well, let me back up. It's, it's important to make a distinction between the declared facilities and potential secret facilities. And there are different inspections regimes there. Uh, so there are these facilities that we know Iran's operating. The uranium enrichment facility at Natanz, the uranium enrichment facility at, at Qom, which uh, the, the, these other um, facilities. Uh, and so for those facilities, uh, IAEA inspectors, the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, based in, in Vienna, uh, will have inspectors on the ground um, at these facilities, monitoring these facilities, uh, in some way, uh, either personally or with cameras and other tools, uh, continuously, basic constant presence at these declared facilities. Um, so it will be very difficult for Iran to do anything untoward at those facilities without getting caught. So if they try to enrich to higher levels or put in place new centrifuges, we'll likely catch them. Uh, the second part is, uh, what about the undeclared facilities? Uh, so you may have heard about this military base at Parchin. Uh, there's this military base in Iran where uh, we're pretty certain that Iran worked on actual nuclear weapons design uh, back in 2003. Uh, and the IAEA has been trying to get access to that military site for seven or eight years, and Iran has consistently said no. Uh, so that's obviously a problem. If there are facilities where we think nuclear work is going on, but the Iranians don't let us in, you know, how do we know they're not just making the bomb there? So the IAEA has to have some ability to get to these undeclared facilities. You know, if there's a military base somewhere, or a, uh, is there a new airport in uh, Berkeley? This is a <laughs> Oh, OK. OK, appropriate for uh, talking. Yeah, it's the, uh, it's the IEA. Um, um, so there is, uh, so what if the IEA inspectors think that maybe Iran's doing nuclear work at a military base, or there's some shed somewhere that Iran claims is you know, an agricultural facility, but we think there's nuclear work going on? So the procedure there is the, the IAEA will have to request access. Uh, the Iranians then can either grant access, uh, in which case, no problem, or they can say no. If the Iranians say no, then it goes to a committee. Uh, and so this is going to be a committee of the P5 plus one, so the five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany uh, plus Iran, so uh, seven countries. And there will be a vote. Uh, and if a majority vote says that the IEA should get access, then according to the terms of the deal, the IEA should get access. Now, the administration says we can count on our allies, the, the Brits, the French, and the Germans to vote with us. So therefore, we've basically got a built-in majority. So if there are any disputes, it'll go to this committee, and we'll vote, and Iran uh, will have to let them in. And according to the terms of the deal, if at that point Iran says no, then that will be a clear violation uh, of, of the agreement. So, this gets to, so that's the inspections part of it. This gets to the third part then. What happens? Uh, what are remaining uh, kind of tools of, of leverage? What if Iran cheats? What are our, what's our recourse? 
Uh, so what the deal does is, is something that's uh, pretty clever, really. Um, it has so-called snapback sanctions. Uh, so as I said, we put in place this um, intrusive inspections regime over the course of the, of the past, or not intrusive, but uh, intense, um, comprehensive sanctions regime over the course of 10 years. Um, but Iran's at the negotiating table because it wants these sanctions lifted. Uh, so the sanctions will be lifted um, basically up front, uh, a few months after uh, there are kind of details in, in the agreement of uh, different steps Iran has to meet in the next few months, but then uh, all these sanctions will be lifted. Um, now what the international community in the United States was trying to negotiate was more of a kind of phased approach where they would take some steps and we'd provide some sanctions relief uh, and so on, but that was un unacceptable to Iran. Uh, they said they wanted all the sanctions relief up front. So they, they get the sanctions relief up front, uh, but the idea is that if Iran is caught cheating, then the sanctions will be snapped back into place. Uh, so rather than taking the sanctions off the books completely, uh, they'll kind of remain in place, they uh, won't be enforced, uh, but then if Iran is caught in violation, the sanctions will snap back into place. Now there are a lot of uh, legitimate questions about how this will work in practice. It's never really been uh, done before. Um, and many people have pointed out that you know, sanctions aren't like a light switch that you can just kind of turn on and off. Uh, it took us 10 years to build, uh, build this uh, sanctions regime. And lifting the sanctions means that in practice, foreign com companies, uh, foreign countries are going to start doing business with Iran, start uh, signing contracts, going in making investments. And so if they go in and do that and we say sanctions are snapped back, you know, it's going to be difficult to, to unwind that. Um, and in fact, there are also, there's some clauses in the deal that grandfather in um, deals um, um, between now and between any possible violations. Uh, this is something the Iranians wanted to convince firms that they could go in with little risk. Uh, so that's our, our real um, source of leverage if Iran cheats the snapback sanctions. Um, now another point that's uh, very important are the, is the sunset clause. So these restrictions I mentioned before on Iran's nuclear facilities aren't permanent. Um, so they'll, they'll uh, go in place um, as soon as the deal begins. but. Uh, after eight years, some of those restrictions will start to fall off. And after 15 years, they're lifted completely. Uh, so after 15 years, uh, Iran will, according to the terms of the deal, and consistent with its international agreements, uh, could have as many enrichment facilities as it wants, the most advanced centrifuges that it wants, as many centrifuges as it wants, stockpile large amounts of enriched uranium. And that would be completely consistent uh, with the terms of the deal. Um, of course, the United States and the international community wanted uh, a deal that would be permanent, uh, but the Iranians uh, said they were unwilling to accept that. Uh, so what we got was this basically 15-year uh, deal. Uh, so what happens then at the, at the end of 15 years? That's another uh, problem. Um, and so what the uh, administration argues is that any tools that we have today, uh, we would still have in 15 years. Uh, so in 15 years, uh, maybe we can try to negotiate a new deal with Iran. Uh, maybe, um, you know, if, if they do things that, that we find um, threatening, that we could try to put new sanctions on Iran in 15 years. And uh, the administration says uh, we would still have the military option. And so some um, uh, former Obama administration officials are saying that perhaps we should make that explicit now, to say now that if in 15 years Iran um, ramps up its enrichment program in a way that we find uh, unacceptable, that we would be willing to use military force to stop them. Um, so this is basically um, what's in the deal. Uh, so what does the United States and, and what does the West get out of this deal? Well, uh, we get restrictions on Iran's nuclear program for 15 years, uh, and we diffuse the crisis, at least in the short term. We're pushing, pushing any real confrontation off into the future, assuming Iran abides by it. Uh, what does Iran get out of the deal? Well, Iran gets to, to keep a fairly large nuclear infrastructure. Uh, for over 10 years now, the United States and the international community was saying, you have to shut this all down. Uh, now they get to keep uh, a lot of the program with, with limits, but they get to keep it, and then in 15 years get a program really without limits. And then also they get this uh, sanctions relief. And moreover, they, they kind of come out uh, from, from the cold. Uh, they've been on the wrong side of these UN Security Council resolutions, have been violating their international commitments. Uh, and now uh, there's going to be, there already has been a U new UN Security Council resolution passed saying these old Security Council resolutions against Iran are now null and, null and void. Uh, we have this new Security Council resolution kind of um, ratifying this new status quo. Okay. Uh, so 
Transitioning to the third part of the talk then, uh, what is the, the best case uh, for, for the argument? Um, so I think uh, the best case, uh, I'm sorry, the best case for the deal. The best case for the deal, I think, is that uh, this buys us at least 15 years, um, assuming Iran doesn't cheat. Uh, and you know, who knows, 15 years from now, maybe Iran will be a fundamentally different place. Uh, maybe it won't have such a threatening foreign policy. Maybe it'll have a different kind of government. Uh, and this nuclear issue won't be a problem anymore. You know, maybe there'll be some kind of democratic revolution in Iran. We'll have great relations with Iran, and we can uh, address it 15 years from now. Um, but even if not, uh, the administration would argue, you know, we buy 15 years, which is more than we can guarantee with any other approach. Uh, military strike wouldn't guarantee 15 years. Uh, none of the other more sanctions doesn't guarantee 15 years. Um, and if they cheat, uh, it's likely that we'll catch them. Uh, and I think that's probably right. If they cheat, at least at the declared facilities, it's likely that we'll catch them. And then we can try to snap sanctions back into place or some other things. But I think you know, the best case for the deal admits that that's, that's still kind of a weakness. Uh, if they cheat, you know, snap back sanctions, will, will that work well? Uh, if not, then really the military option is the only remaining option we have to stop them. So that's a possible problem. What if Iran um, signs the deal, abides by it for two years or so, uh, and then you know, gets the sanctions relief? and then starts to, to cheat on the, the terms and ramp up its nuclear program. We can try to snap back sanctions, it might not work, uh, then we might have to do the military option. So I think even, I, I, in my view, an intellectually honest argument for the deal admits that that's, that's kind of a weakness. But you know, we could catch them, but the snap back could be difficult. Um, and then, you know, what, what happens when, in 15 years when, when this expires? Um, and so that's, that's a real problem, I think, an intellectually honest case for the deal. You have to admit that that's a real weakness. We, we have to have some kind of band-aids on the back end uh, to deal with that. Um, so in sum, in, in my view, that what this deal does really is, is likely slow Iran's program down, but I don't think it fundamentally resolves the issue. It allows them to keep uh, this large nuclear weapons capability, because you know, again, once they have enrichment capability, they essentially have the ability to make fuel for nuclear weapons. So it allows Iran to keep that. Um, it does provide them the sanctions relief up front, which uh, gives away one of our, our best tools, one of the only things that, that's gotten around to the table to this point. Um, and then also I worry about uh, the precedent um, that it sets. Uh, so as I said before, the United States has essentially, you know, uh, not perfectly, but, but tried to toe this, this strong line of a clear divide between peaceful nuclear technology and, and enrichment and reprocessing. Um, and so I, I'm worried that this will set a precedent. In fact, I was in Seoul, South Korea, just a couple of weeks ago. So as I said, the South Koreans had a reprocessing program in the 1970s. Uh, for the past several, several years, they've been saying they want to enrich and reprocess for peaceful purposes. Uh, and the United States has been saying no. In fact, we negotiated a, a so-called 1-2-3 agreement. Uh, this is what we call our nuclear cooperation agreements with other countries. Uh, we negotiated this 1-2-3 uh, agreement with South Korea just earlier this year, in which South Korea agreed not to enrich or reprocess, at least for now. Uh, but the agreement said something about how, in, in the future conditions, uh, we could reopen this point of negotiation. Uh, so when I was in, in Seoul, um, th they said, well, you know, thanks for deciding this enrichment reprocessing issue for us. You know, glad this is resolved. Uh, because if Iran, uh, a country that's cheated on its international agreements, that's a US enemy, uh, is allowed to have these kind of capabilities, why can't we, South Korea, good democratic ally, uh, also have these capabilities? Uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE, um, officials from both countries, have said whatever capabilities Iran gets in this deal, uh, that they will also get. So I think there is uh, a possibility of uh, the setting a bad precedent where other countries are going to want these nuclear weapons capabilities. Now, the deal explicitly says uh, that this doesn't set a new precedent, that other countries are still need to uh, abide by the, uh, the kind of pre-existing terms and norms in the non-proliferation regime. Um, but you know, wh whether that argument will be persuasive or not, I think, uh, is, is an open question. Okay. But, and one of, the, one, one of the final arguments that deal supporters make is, you know, it's not a perfect deal. Uh, there is this problem with the sunset. There is this problem of what do we do if Iran cheats. But it's better than the alternatives. Uh, there's no viable alternative. Uh, what's the alternative? So now kind of transitioning into the fourth part of the talk, I think that that, I think that, that argument's incorrect. I think that there is uh, a viable, viable alternative. It's not perfect either. Again, in foreign policy, you're often choosing uh, among bad options, and I think it's a bad option. The quest question is which, is which is worse. So I think the alternative is um, to, to keep the pressure uh, on Iran, uh, to keep the sanctions in place. 
um, to, um, um, let me just say a little bit about that because I already see some, some head shanking. Because I think there's this conventional wisdom that you know, we can't keep the sanctions in place. Other countries uh, are fed up with the sanctions. They're willing, they're ready to run in and, and do business. And I think that's true, but I think it also uh, misses a fundamental point, which is that other countries have always been reluctant to sanction Iran. Um, you know, the United States is the most powerful state in the international system. The United States uh, has always been the country that cares most about nuclear nonproliferation. And this is something I, I talk about uh, in the book. So getting international cooperation on nuclear nonproliferation has always required U.S. leadership. And so this was the case in 2003, uh, up until 2006, when we got the first U.N. Security Council resolution. We were trying to get other countries to join us in sanctions. They weren't interested. They wanted to buy Iranian oil and trade with Iran. Uh, but finally, um, you know, we convinced them there was a problem. We convinced them uh, that they had to join us in this, and, and we got them on board. Uh, so it is very true now that, that countries are eager to rush back in and do business with Iran. Uh, but that's because uh, the White House is signaling that Iran's going to be open for business soon. Uh, we've solved this problem to our satisfaction. Uh, and so, of course, these countries are eager to get back in. They, they never wanted to sanction Iran in the first place. But if the United States had said, we haven't solved the problem yet, the problem's enrichment, uh, we need to, to end the enrichment program, uh, then I think other countries uh, would have been willing to continue to su support the sanctions. And it's not just my, my judgment. I, in the past, over the course of the summer, I was in Beijing, uh, Seoul, and Delhi uh, talking about these issues and um, you know, asked them uh, point blank if the United States decided to keep sanctions pressure on Iran for nonproliferation purposes, either because Congress votes against this deal or because a new president in 2017 wants to go in a different direction, would you be willing to, to support those sanctions? And they all said, well, we really wouldn't want to. We, we really want to trade with Iran. We could use Iranian oil. Um, keeping these sanctions in place is going to be bad for our economy. But realistically, what the US sanctions, in essence, force us to do is choose between doing business with the United States, the largest economy on Earth, or doing business with Iran. And given that choice, uh, there's really no choice. Of course, we'll do business with the United States. So yeah, they grudgingly admitted that they would be willing to keep sanctions. And if you pay attention to the sanctions debate, you know, it's not British or French or, or Russian leaders saying we're tired of these sanctions, we want to trade with Iran. It's uh, people in Washington, DC making, making the case for the deal. Uh, there's really no evidence, I, I think, at high levels in foreign governments of saying, um, you know, we're tired of these sanctions, we're, we're, we want to trade with Iran. Uh, so that's the first part. I think you keep the sanctions on. Uh, but what is, the, what is the purpose of keeping the sanctions on? Well, it's, of course, in, in my view, getting towards a, a good deal. And a good deal is one that I think would resolve this problem once and for all. And the problem is enrichment. Uh, and so I think it was a mistake to come off of our zero enrichment line. I think we should have continued to say um, uh, Iran needs to shut down its enrichment program completely. But it can have a peaceful nuclear program, like the vast majority of countries on Earth, like Mexico. Uh, they can have nuclear power reactors. They can have nuclear research reactors. They can just have the fuel provided by Russia or France or some other country and then ship the fuel back when they're done. Um, if they really want a nuclear energy program, that's the model that the vast majority of countries use. So if this is really about a peaceful program, fine, you can have a peaceful program, uh, but enrichment's uh, out, of the, out of the question. Now, some people say, well, getting Iran to, to agree to that would have been impossible. Uh, it's an argument you often hear, it would have been impossible. Uh, and maybe it would be. Uh, we don't know because we didn't fully, fully test it. Um, but you know, I would point out that there are many cases in the past where things that people said in negotiated deals over nuclear issues where people said it's impossible it turned out not to be impossible. Uh, so, for example, uh, Libya had an enrichment program in, in the early 2000s, uh, also with Pakistani help. Um, through negotiations, through sanctions, uh, Colonel Gaddafi in Libya agreed to give up his enrichment program completely. Uh, within weeks after the deal, U.S. military aircraft were flying out literally tons of centrifuges and other sensitive nuclear parts. Um, again, South Korea and Taiwan uh, countries had reprocessing programs. Uh, we convinced them to shut them down completely. It wasn't about, well, you we can keep a little bit. It was, it was zero. <coughs> and even with Iran, the, uh, the interim deal negotiated in late 2012, um, just weeks before that, really weeks before that, people were saying it's going to be impossible to get a deal with Iran. Uh, we're facing this choice very quickly of either bombing Iran or letting Iran have nuclear weapons. And then suddenly the sanctions really started to have an effect on Iran, uh, changed the domestic politics, Rouhani was elected, and then weeks later we have this interim deal. Uh, so people said that was impossible, we got it. So I'm not convinced that 
a zero enrichment deal with Iran is impossible. Maybe, maybe I'm uh, wrong, but, but I'm not convinced of that. Finally, people will say, well, if we kind of tear up this deal or, or go back on it, then Iran, you know, if we give up our end of the bargain, Iran's free to give up its end of the bargain. It can start um, ramping up its nuclear program again, given that we're only two to three months uh, away. Again, that conditional two to three months if he dashes, which I think is unlikely. I think if the deal fell through, that it's likely that Iran would build up its program kind of slowly, uh, like it had been for the previous years, you know, more centrifuges, more advanced centrifuges, not blatantly dashing for a weapon, but slowly expanding its program. So how do you deal uh, against that? Well, I think the only way to deal against that is to, uh, to set clear military red lines, uh, which I know is not a popular point of view often in, in Northern California, but it is a tool of, of foreign policy. Uh, so make it clear to Iran that you know, if you uh, cross certain lines, if you enrich to, to high enough levels, uh, that, that could trigger a, a military strike from Israel or from the United States, and so you better not do it. Um, so you may remember a few years ago, Benjamin Netanyahu was at uh, the UN General Assembly, and he gave uh, a talk about Iran's program, and he had the, the cartoonish picture of a bomb, and he drew the red line across it, uh, and, and people um, you know, f uh, made fun of it, um, and for, for good reason. It was kind of silly having uh, the drawing up there. But what's less noted is that the red line he spelled out, Iran didn't cross. Um, and some uh, friends of mine who work uh, in Washington have said that you know, it was very clear to the Iranians um, that if they went too far, that there was a real risk of, of war and that the Iranians didn't want that. And that's part of the reason they haven't expanded their program uh, further. So I think then part of the alternative is setting these clear lines, saying don't expand your, too pr your program too far or else uh, who knows what might happen, uh, keeping the sanctions in place and holding out this good deal. If they really want a peaceful program, they can have a peaceful program. They just uh, can enrich. And so I think if we went down that path, there were three possible outcomes. So one is Iran would say, well, we hear you on your red lines, but we don't care. We're going to dash ahead anyway. And that would lead to, to a military conflict. And that is possible. And I think that's an intellectually honest part of saying um, you know, you're not in favor of this deal, that it could lead to a, to a near-term conflict, something that's less likely, I think, with the deal. But I also think it's, it's unlikely. You know, I, I think that if we're clear that this could lead to a conflict, the Iranians don't want a, a war over this, I think they would be deterred from, from crossing those lines as they had been in the past. So I think the, the, the second outcome is that eventually that pressure would, would begin to mount, Iran would be boxed in, and they would agree to this zero enrichment deal like we got in Libya and, and in other places. I think the third possibility with this route, and probably the most likely, at least in the short to medium term, is kind of a continuation of the stalemate we had before this deal. Um, that uh, the sanctions would continue to mount, Iran might slowly advance its program, and there'd be uh, kind of a stalemate. So I know for many people that's not very uh, satisfying. The kind of promise of just resolving this now, at least for the short term, feels good. Uh, the idea of going back to this pressure track, maybe having this kind of longer term uh, standoff continue, uh, doesn't seem very palatable. But if what we're trying to do is stop Iran from build nuclear, building nuclear weapons, which is what we've said our goal is all along, which is what the administration has said their goal is, uh, then the only way to do that is, is to get rid of the enrichment program. Uh, and this deal doesn't do that. This deal allows Iran to have uh, an enrichment program and to have one without limits uh, in, in 15 years. And so, you know, and on one hand, 15 years is a long time. On the other hand, I, I hope to still be around in 15 years. And that's going to be a heck of a problem to, to deal with whoever's uh, in power at that point. Uh, so in the end, I think it really depends on priorities. You know, do you prioritize um, avoiding conflict in the near term uh, and you know, hoping that um, maybe this leads to better relations between Iran and the rest of the world um, and that, yeah, this might be really problematic in 15 years, but we'll deal with it then, you know, in which case you should probably support the deal. Uh, if you think that you know, we've, we've worked for 10 years to get to this point, uh, we've built up all this pressure, uh, we were within sight of, of really solving the issue, not just kicking it down the road, and you're comfortable with continued kind of ambiguity, uh, then I think uh, the, the, the right solution is to, to um, be opposed to this deal and to push for, um, push for a return to the pressure track. Uh, in practice, where are we likely to end up? Well, as I mentioned two days ago, it uh, looks like enough Democratic senators have come out so that President Obama can um, override any veto. So just to point out, uh, most of the public opinion polling shows that the vast, well, a, a majority anyway, of the American people are opposed to this deal. 
Um, a majority of members of Congress are, are opposed to this deal. Um, there's bipartisan opposition to the deal, in fact. Uh, all Republicans oppose it. Some Democrats oppose it. Uh, and so the question is, would the president get enough votes to, to override any veto? And it looks like at this point he does have those votes. So it looks likely now what will happen is Congress will vote uh, against the deal, uh, the president will veto it, and then um, Congress won't be able to override. So it looks likely then that this deal will be in place for the next 18 months or so. The next critical juncture then is January 2017, uh, because every uh, major Republican presidential candidate has said that this is a terrible deal and that they'll terminate it. They've used different language on day one immediately. There's even been some dispute about how quickly they would terminate it. That's kind of where the debate is uh, on the Republican side, and not about whether you're for it or not, but how quickly do you get rid of it. So if uh, a Republican is, is elected, then I think it is likely that we'll kind of return to this pressure track, uh, that the U.S. will reinstate sanctions. Um, I mentioned that there's a snapback clause for us, but there's also a snapback clause for Iran. Uh, the deal says that if uh, the United States and the international community doesn't provide sanctions relief, then Iran's at liberty to uh, advance its nuclear program. So I think we'll put in place more sanctions, Iran will advance its nuclear program, and then we'll, um, if a Republican's elected, and we'll turn to this alternative strategy that I talked about. Uh, if Hillary Clinton's elected, it's likely, she said she supports the deal, it's likely it'll stay in place. Um, so I think that's where we are, and that's where we're going. And with that, maybe I'll uh, conclude my formal remarks, but look forward to uh, questions and comments and discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate it. Um, very good to hear your thoughts. Um, I'm going to pay particular attention to those who look like students. So I know there are a lot of students out there, um, but we have a lot of the community as well. So I'll start with first question over here. And hold on, I'm going to give you the microphone, which is necessary so that your question can be picked up by the uh, recording device. Thank you. Uh, two questions. First is, I've only heard the term uranium enrichment. Now, a uranium bomb is certainly almost trivial to build once you've got the material. What about uh, plutonium? Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't heard that mentioned at all. Is it just totally not considered, or is it a totally different process? So what are the uh, issues regarding plutonium bombs? Yeah, it's a good question, and uh, this is obviously, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I wrote a book about the subject, so I could probably talk for weeks on end, so um, focused on some parts and not others. So as I mentioned before, there are two different ways to produce fuel for nuclear weapons. One is enriching uranium, which has really been at the heart of this dispute. Uh, but the second way is to reprocess plutonium. Uh, so Iran was, um, we think, pursuing both paths to the bomb. It has this large enrichment program that we've spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, but it also was constructing this heavy water reactor at Iraq, A-R-A-K. Um, now there are Looks like there, uh, from uh, seems like there's a lot of knowledge in the room. There might be people from nuclear engineering here, so please uh, you know jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. I'm a mere political scientist, so I'm <laughs> I'm basically uneducated. Um, but um, uh, so there are basically two types of, of nuclear power reactors: light water reactors and, and heavy water reactors. They both produce nuclear energy, uh, but heavy water reactors uh, are bomb making machines because they produce large amounts of plutonium. Um, so the United States has always encouraged light water reactors and has um, tried to prevent the spread of heavy water reactors. So Iran has been building this heavy water reactor, the bad reactor at Iraq. Uh, and so for years we were telling Iran, you know, if you want light water reactors, it's not a problem. And they said, no, we want this uh, heavy water reactor. Um, so this gets to another point. You know, often the question is raised, does Iran really want nuclear weapons or does it just really want peaceful nuclear energy? Uh, and I think if you know, we just treat this as social scientists. We have two hypotheses here. Let's look at the evidence. Which one does the evidence support? I mean, there are about a half dozen things that Iran's doing that makes really no sense if they were truly interested in nuclear energy, only makes sense if they're interested in nuclear weapons. So I think at a minimum, uh, you, um, it's safe to conclude that Iran clearly wanted nuclear weapons at some point. Uh, I believe they, they still do, but I think you can maybe say maybe they've, they've changed their mind. Um, but coming back to Iraq. Uh, so we've asked them to shut down Iraq. What this deal will do is uh, the Iraq reactor won't be shut down. The Iranians said that that would be uh, too humiliating for them to, to shut down any uh, facilities. That was one of the Supreme Leader's red lines, uh, that none of the facilities could be shut down completely. Uh, but the deal will have the reactor modified in a way that apparently produces less plutonium. Uh, so again, maybe there are people in the 
audience who know more about this than I do, but uh, experts from the Department of Energy have, U.S. Department of Energy essentially helped uh, design a remodification that makes them comfortable that it would be harder for Iran to produce large amounts of plutonium uh, at Iraq. Uh, but that limit, too, is only in place for 15 years. Uh, so in 15 years, Iran would be free, uh, like with its enrichment program, to have uh, heavy water reactors, to have reprocessing facilities. Uh, so that is another proliferation risk. Now, we had a model example here of a concise question, uh, that, uh, not, a, not a long speech. And so uh, we will all try and follow that, uh, follow that model. My next question is over here. And I'll try to be briefer in my response. That was... Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's one word you didn't use, which was Stuxnet. Mm, yeah. So um, to try and put it in the question, um, really, don't we have to see everything in the context of Stuxnet? This mm. is an attempt to stop the Iranian nuclear program by uh, tech means. Mm -hmm. And um, we were told a cock and bull story about the guys picking up thumb drives in the car park. What really happened? Mm. Well, um, you know, I, I don't know mo much more than what's been been reported, but um, you know, to the Stuxnet was this um, uh, uh, a worm, I guess, a computer worm, a cyber attack um, that uh, David Sanger in the New York Times has, has reported on this and it's his book, so that's where I'm getting my information. But according to Sanger, this was a joint project between the United States and Israel uh, to attack uh, the operating control system that operates the centrifuges in the uranium enrichment facilities. So it was a Siemens uh, control um, uh, uh, system, uh, German company Siemens. Uh, and so this was a, a very sophisticated uh, attack. And people who know cyber better than I do say that, you know, the average kind of worm or, or bug is a couple of lines long. And th this thing was, you know, like a, an encyclopedia was so complicated. But what it did in practice was, um, well, let me back up. These centrifuges are incredibly uh, delicate. You basically spinning large metal cylinders at the speed of sound. Uh, so that's a difficult task. In fact, they're so delicate that apparently the oils from the human hand can be enough to cause them to spin out of control and crash. And so the Iranians had a problem with this uh, early on. They finally realized they had to don these special gloves to, to make sure that didn't happen. Um, so what this worm did was it told the panel to slowly or kind of imperceptibly change the speed at which the centrifuges were spinning. And it changed it just enough to call, cause them to spin out of control and, and crash. Um, but the other thing that was clever about it, it uh, in the control room, uh, it sig signified that everything was operating normally. So the Iranians struggled for months to figure out what the heck was going on. They thought everything was operating fine, but these centrifuges uh, continued to crash on the ground. Um, but th I think the broader point is what about maybe um, is what about covert means? Are there covert means we can use to stop Iran's program? So there have been cyber attacks. You've probably also heard um, news reports about. Uh, assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists, which many people have suggested uh, that is Israel might be, be behind those. Uh, so there are these different um, covert means. There have also been reports about intelligence agencies uh, sneaking uh, faulty parts into the Iranian supply chains, uh, causing problems. Um, and so I have a chapter on, on the Iran book that Neil mentioned about these kind of covert uh, means. And so you know, we, we've been trying these for, for 10 years or so, but if you just look at the IAE reports, uh, that come out every three months that document the advance of Iran's nuclear program. From 2003 up until we got this interim deal, uh, the program continued to advance by all objective measures, number of centrifuges, uh, stockpiles of, of enriched uranium. So these covert methods might have been slowing Iran down some, but they certainly weren't going to be enough on their own to stop it. Iran continued to make advances despite that. Uh, so you know, cyber attack and, and sabotage and these kind of things um, in the future may have to be part of a non-proliferation strategy for Iran or other countries, but my own view is it's on its own probably insufficient. Thank you, Matt. Uh, my question is, I know a few years ago, a big indication that Iran was looking at nuclear weapons was that they had a pretty strong ICBM program. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, what's the status of that program? Is any work going on? And also, um, it, are arms control agreements only an option for containment after they've developed weapons, or is there some sort of agreement that could be made on their ICBM technology? Yeah. No, it's a good question. So, um, uh, you know, back to this question of does Iran want nuclear energy or does it want nuclear weapons? I mean, some of the other signs that it wants nuclear weapons is, one, uh, we're pretty certain that they were actually designing uh, nuclear warheads back in 2003. Why design nuclear warheads if you don't want them? Uh, second, they have uh, an ICBM program. 
Uh, so Iran has one of the most well-developed ballistic missile programs in the world, uh, certainly the most advanced in the Middle East. It currently has short-range and in intermediate-range ballistic missiles that can reach all the Middle East and even parts of, of Southern Europe. And it's working on an ICBM, an intercontinental range ballistic missile. Uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Defense does a report, a public uh, declassified report on uh, Iranian military power every year. Um, the most recent one said that if Iran, if Iran gets outside help, so caveat, if, if Iran gets outside help, it could have an ICBM capable of reaching the east coast of the United States by the end of 2015. Um, and I think people don't uh, recognize that. I think people think that we're concerned about Iran because of the threat to Israel. Uh, but in the future, this could pose a direct threat to, to the U.S. homeland if they have nuclear weapons uh, mounted on ICBMs. So early on, uh, there was um, a lot of debate in these negotiations about whether the negotiations should also be aimed at Iran's broader set of activities that we're concerned about. Should it just be about the, the fissile material production part? Or should it also include ballistic missiles? Should it also include Iran's support for terrorism? Um, and the administration argued uh, and the conclusion they came to in the end was, well, if they don't have a nuclear warhead, then the, the ICBM is of less concerns. And getting a deal on just the fissile material production part is going to be hard enough. Uh, so let's focus our energies there and not discuss terrorism and ballistic missiles and, and other things. Uh, but there were many critics who said the ballistic missiles are a real problem. Any deal with Iran has to include the ballistic missiles. In the end, what happened was something that, that I, I didn't see uh, fourth uh, coming, and I don't think a lot of people did, which is in the last few days of the negotiations, when, when we thought uh, we almost had a deal, um, Iran suddenly said, you know, not only do we not want to negotiate on putting limits on our ballistic missiles, the current embargoes and bans and things you have in place, we want lifted. And we gave in to that. Um, so these conventional missile uh, or, or conventional weapons embargoes and ballistic missile embargoes on Iran will also be lifted as part of this deal. So I should have mentioned that. So after six years, uh, international embargoes against Iranian uh, conventional weapons will be lifted. And after eight years, uh, embargo on ballistic missiles. So after eight years, according to the terms of the deal, Iran can legally engage in international trade in, in the area of ballistic missiles. When you're done, would you give it to this gentleman? Yes, sir. Uh, well, the conversation was heading towards Israel already, so so, but uh, so basically, I don't have much to add. But I, my question is basically, what what do you think Israel's reaction will be? Uh, sh uh, he, Israel is known to uh, m march to his own drum in situations mm -hmm. when he feels threatened. Yeah. Um, well, in, um, in my line of work, I I spend uh, quite a bit of time in Israel, so I don't know if some of you know Israelis or. Um, but there's a joke in Israel that if you ask uh, two Israelis, uh, you'll get three opinions, um, which is you know kind of the, 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 that Israelis can't agree on anything. And so, given that, I think it's quite remarkable actually how much uh, consensus there is on this issue. Uh, the public polling in Israel is basically 80% uh, of the Israeli public is against this deal, 20% uh, supports it, and at the official levels, there's there's no disagreement. Uh, Netanyahu and, and the government and, and elected members of, uh, of the Knesset are opposed uh, to this deal. Um, and I think that they have a, a number of concerns. One is that I think, uh, like me, they, they fear that this won't stop Iran from building nuclear weapons. But I think it's also they have a broader concern about um, what this means for Iranian power and influence in the region and about America's uh, influence in the region. And so I think both the Israelis and also some of our partners in, in the Gulf uh, see this as uh, essentially turning the keys of kind of hegemony in the region over to Iran, uh, that they'll be able to trade, they'll be able to trade, and, and, and you know, so their economy will improve, uh, they'll be able to trade in conventional uh, weapons and ballistic missiles, uh, and what they see as a, a slow kind of U.S. withdrawal from the region, um, they're, they're afraid that they're being hung out to dry to deal with this new uh, Iranian power. So I think some of those um, views are, are, are overblown, but I do share their concern that this um, this deal uh, isn't a good deal if really what we want to do is, is stop Iran from building nuclear weapons. I think it will uh, delay it. Uh, and then the other concern, of course, is that um, you know, other countries in the region might take steps in response. So as I mentioned, Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE have said that they might build similar capabilities. So some have said that this, you know, it won't be an arms race as intense as if Iran had nuclear weapons. Uh, but given that they have this capability, I think other countries in the region will try to develop a similar capability, which uh, could be problematic. And I think this is something that uh, the White House understands. And so 
they also have this kind of strategy of trying to reassure Israel and trying to reassure the Gulf states uh, that will continue to be there uh, for them. So there's talk about selling them more conventional military hardware, of maybe selling them more ballistic missile defenses. Um, but it is something of a paradox. On one hand, we're saying this is a good deal that solves the nuclear problem. On the other hand, we're saying, you know, here's a bunch of stuff to protect you if, if Iran gets nuclear weapons. Um, so there's uh, something of a paradox, I think, there. But. Do you think the Israel is going to act, or act alone if, oh. if it finds it necessary? Good question. Um, so I think there was a time several years ago when there was a real risk that Israel would take military action, and it's something that they've done in the past. They bombed the, uh, a nuclear reactor in Iraq in 1981. They bombed a nuclear reactor in Syria in 2007. Um, in 2010 or so, um, I think there was a real risk that, that Israel was going to bomb. I think now um, Iran's program is, is large enough and, and deeply buried enough that Israel's military option isn't very good. Uh, and the Israelis uh, understand that. So um, Israel's not happy with the deal, but they don't really have good options on their own. All of their best options really run through the White House. They'd like to see tougher sanctions, but it's only the White House that can orchestrate that. I think uh, some in Israel would like to see a US military attack because the United States does have uh, capabilities, unlike Israel, to destroy even these deeply buried facilities. Um, uh, so at this point, you know, I don't think they have very good options other than to complain and to make it clear that they're opposed to this deal, uh, to, to lobby, uh, you know, lobby members of Congress to convince them to vote against it, although it looks like, um, again, that Congress um, uh, won't have the votes to override. So the only way I could see Israel taking military action is if in the future it became clear that Iran was moving towards a nuclear weapons capability, kind of dashing to a bomb. And it was clear that despite all these promises of all options on the table, that the United States wasn't going to take action. In those conditions, I'm, I'm fairly confident that Israel probably would conduct a strike, um, knowing full well that it wouldn't be able to destroy all the facilities, but just going ahead and doing whatever damage it could, and then seeing how things play out. Uh, some Israeli uh, military planners I've talked to, when you say, you know, well, you, couldn't, you probably couldn't get the facility at Qom. It's buried in the side of a mountain under 295 feet of rock. You know, and what if, what if Iran rebuilds? You know, what do you do then? And they say, well, it's kind of like mowing the grass. You know, you, you take care of it once, and then if it grows back, you, you take care of it again. Um, so I don't think that that's likely in the short term. But again, in this kind of worst case scenario where Iran's clearly dashing and the U.S. clearly isn't going to take action, and then I think they might. So now that we've agreed to allow proliferation to some degree, um, how what do you think are the prospects of preventing all these other countries from pursuing nuclear means um, in the future? I mean, w could we have six, eight, ten more nuclear countries or on the verge since intellectually we've said it's kind of okay enough? Yeah. No, it's one of my major uh, concerns. And, um, you know, um, uh, there have been, been a lot of Senate testimonies on, on this issue. Uh, with people who are more experienced and, and smarter than I am. Uh, and this is a point that's continually come up. Um, uh, Henry Kissinger, for one, said, uh, we've moved from a world of preventing proliferation to managing it uh, in the wake of this deal. So I mean, I think what we'll, we'll try to do is, is try to say that this doesn't set a precedent, that the same old rules apply to everyone else. Enrichment reprocessing is still a problem. Um, but I think it's a harder, harder argument to make, again, because we're not just making an exception for any country. We're making an exception for Iran, a country that has cheated on its agreements, that's been uh, an adversary. So again, much harder to, to go to Seoul and look your allies in, in, in the face or you know, partners in the Gulf and say, you know, we, we trust Iran with this capability, but we don't trust you. So I think we'll, we'll try our best. And we do have a number of means at our disposal that we've used over the course of the decades to try to discourage proliferation, um, such as um, you know, providing uh, explicit security guarantees, providing other forms of, of U.S. military protection uh, to make them uh, feel secure. And so I think we'll try uh, all of those tools. Um, but I, I think it is much harder after this deal. Um, so we've heard a little bit about the economic interests of other countries in investing in Iran. Are there interests actually in the United States that are also sort of lining up behind this deal in terms of their ability to make those same investments? Yeah. There's been less in the U.S. Uh, so far, and I think a large part of that is because um, the U.S. has essentially been cut out of the, or the United States has uh, prevented its firms from operating in the Iranian market going back 
uh, a long time. You know, we started putting sanctions against Iran in 1979. Uh, those sanctions continued to increase until by 1995, uh, Bill Clinton had basically um, cut off all direct U.S. Uh, trade and financial ties between the United States and, and Iran. Um, whereas these other countries have been doing business with Iran much more recently, and so they're getting out of the Iranian market is much more recent, so I think they're better prepared to, to going back in. Um, so the new, uh, this is an important point I could have made before maybe, so the U.S. has essentially cut off all trade investment with Iran in 95. So you might be asking, well, what are all these sanctions I've been hearing about and Congress passing new sanctions? So essentially what the United States has done with sanctions over the past 10 years or so are these, uh, they're sometimes called secondary sanctions or third party sanctions. But basically the United States is threatening to, if foreign other countries or other countries' firms do business with Iran, will sanction those countries and those companies. So it's not direct sanctions against Iran, it's sanctions against countries that do business with Iran. And so that's why these uh, people I spoke to in uh, Seoul and elsewhere said a choice between doing business with Iran and doing business with the US, not really a choice. Uh, so uh, it will be interesting to see though um, in the United States if these business interests uh, develop because one of the arguments the administration makes in favor of the deal is that, well, if Iran becomes better integrated into the international economy, uh, it starts, the people start to see benefits from this, uh, then it's going to be harder for the regime to build nuclear weapons or break the deal or do other things that might lead to um, a degradation in that business climate. And I think that's a fair point. There's another side to it as well, though. As business interest um, in the West, in Europe, and potentially even at some point in the United States, rush into Iran, uh, then we're going to have a strong economic incentive not to, not to hold Iran uh, accountable. Um, there are also political incentives not to hold Iran accountable. One of the other potential problems I should have mentioned is, you know, if Iran clearly builds, is you know, trying to build nuclear weapons, is enriching as much uranium uh, as possible, as fast as possible, then it's pretty clear that's a violation. I think there'd really be no debate about snapping the sanctions back into place. But what happens if Iran does kind of incremental uh, cheating over the years, you know, small steps, kind of salami slice tactics. You know, at what point are we going to be willing to say, okay, this is this has gone too far. We're going to snap the sanctions back down into place. So really, essentially, you know, we don't have kind of finer grained punishments, and we have this one big punishment. We're uns uncertain really of the effect of snapping sanctions back into place. Uh, so I think what could happen is you could, we could be in the paradoxical situation where the White House essentially becomes Iran's lawyer. Uh, that you know, there are these small scale violations. There'll probably be Republicans on the Hill and elsewhere saying they're violating it. We need to do something. Snap the sanctions back. You said you're going to snap the sanctions back. And I, I can imagine the White House saying, well, this isn't that big of a, a violation. You know, let's let's try to work it out. There's no reason to blow up the deal uh, just yet. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as well. Thank you. Thank you. How does the wider economic and political context has contributed to administrative decisions? Uh, what's going on politically, what's going on in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in Syria. Yeah. And also, economically, the decline need for imported oil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so the broader context, so I, there are colleagues of mine in, in Washington, D.C. who have argued, and I, I disagree with this, to for, foreshadow where I'm going, where, where they say, you know, it, it, the Obama's foreign policy has been all about getting out of the Middle East. He thinks it's a problematic region, so he get, stops the war in Iraq or in Afghanistan, is going to sign this deal with Iran and uh, on, on his way out. Um, I think that you know, that's maybe trying to read too much of a grand strategy into what uh, goes on. I think often in foreign policy, you know, you're making kind of tactical day-to-day -day decisions and dealing with problems as they come up, and you don't have a grand strategy of, of what you're trying to do. So I think that's true here. And I, so I think what happened with the nuclear deal is that I think uh, President Obama and his top advisors really wanted to solve this problem. Um, so if you look back to uh, when Senator Obama wrote, you know, when uh, presidential candidates to show that they're serious on foreign policy almost always publish an article in Foreign Affairs, which is this leading uh, foreign affairs journal. So President Obama's 2008 Foreign Affairs article said that as president, he would stop Iran's enrichment program. Uh, so he's come back from uh, where he originally was. Um, and remember, President Obama made uh, creating a world without nuclear weapons one of the uh, kind of signatures of his foreign policy. He gave this major speech in Prague, Czech Republic, saying he was going to get rid of nuclear weapons. And I think he, he really cares about uh, nuclear proliferation. Uh, so, 
Uh, and I think he understands that if Iran got nuclear weapons, if other countries developed nuclear weapons in response, that that would be deeply antithetical to this vision of a world without nuclear weapons. So my, my read is that he really wanted to solve this problem. And talking to some of his advisors, they said that you know, he, this was one of the worst problems on his plate when he took office and that he didn't want to push it off on his successor. He really wanted to solve it once and for all. And then I think you know, as time went on and it was clear that it was hard, I think they made a decision to just kick the can down the road, to, to solve the problem for now, um, but, but kick the can down the road. And I think it was really, as I said, late 2013 when that decision was basically made to allow Iran to have enrichment. Uh, so I think that that's an important part of the, the calculation. Um, I think it's also the, the, the political calculation is important to, to say that there's this major achievement, you know, that Iran's nuclear problem has been a, a problem for a long time. and we got this, this uh, historic deal. Um, so Ben Rhodes, who was one of the president's speechwriters and uh, deputy national security advisors, uh, was giving a speech, I think, to uh, some political supporters and donors and said that uh, the Iran deal is going to be like health care for us, uh, by which he meant a, a major achievement, health care on the domestic side, Iran on the foreign policy side. So um, I think those are some of the broader issues. But I, I think at the end of the day, they really did want to solve it. And it was just too hard. So uh, they got what they think is the best that they could get. Um, so my question is about where you stand on how the deal, and especially the economic benefits that Iran will receive, will affect the war against the Islamic State, mm. especially with regard to the Iranian-backed Shiite militias who are allied tacitly with the United States in air raids and with the, with the Iraqi security forces and Hezbollah fighting the Islamic State in Syria, and of course the inextricable war against Assad in turn. Yeah, good questions. Uh, so I think there are two different aspects to it. So one is that uh, as part of the deal, Iran's going to get these sanctions relief uh, that, you know, the benefits of which will come in over time. But one of the things that we'll get immediately is these, uh, we've been freezing Iranian assets and those, uh, those will become unfrozen. So depending on which estimates you believe, somewhere between 50 and $150 billion, Iran's going to get in uh, unfrozen assets. Um, so many people say, well, they're supporting all these terror and proxy groups in, in Syria and Lebanon and Iraq and, and Yemen. Uh, clearly, you're giving this big cash infusion to a state sponsor of terror. It's going to go to these groups. Uh, the administration has argued, I think, uh, kind of Im implausibly that, no, you know, they've raised expectations because of the deal. The Iranian people think the economy is going, going to improve, so they have to spend all of this uh, domestically. Um, and I think when asked point blank, Secretary Kerry said, well, maybe some of it will go to terrorism. But the, the, the line is that it's all for the economy. I think in practice, you know, some of it probably will go to, to the economy, but I think uh, some of it will also go to supporting these groups. So that's another potential uh, risk of the deal. Um, but the administration has argued, I think, fairly that you know, that's really an argument against any deal. Um, because if you know, the, the deal that I laid out, you would still have to provide Iran sanctions relief, I think, to get that. But the second aspect is how really how to fight the war against ISIS, I think, which is really complicated. And so there are some who argue, well, Iran is, is fighting against ISIS in, in Iraq, and so we share this interest. We can work together with Iran. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. But I think that's true most places. I'm not sure that it's true in the Middle East. I think in the Middle East, the enemy of your enemy can still be your enemy. Uh, and, I, and so as I, you know, I'm, uh, the way I see it, you know, if we want to if we're serious about destroying ISIS, and we want to do that without putting US boots on the ground, uh, then we need to get other regional uh, partners in the region to, to put boots on the ground. And so in, in the parts of the world that ISIS is controlling now, that means working with uh, Sunni uh, tribes in Iraq. That means working with the Kurds in Iraq. And that also means working with um, moderate elements, free Syrian army in Syria, which doesn't really exist now, but trying to get. Um, and then also working with Turkey, I think. And, and so part of the problem then is all of those groups are threatened by Iran. Uh, and all of those groups are afraid that we're, again, selling out their interest in the region and turning the keys of the region over to Iran. So I don't think we can destroy ISIS by cooperating with Iran and simultaneously alienating all these other groups. I do think it's possible by um, stepping up kind of pressure against Iran, even with this deal in place in other areas, on their support for terrorism to, to show the other states that we need uh, that we're not turning uh, the keys of the region over to Iran, that we're going to keep the pressure up on them. Uh, so uh, as I see it, that's really the only way to, to defeat ISIS, uh, is to, again, uh, kind of, and that's something that, that even Hillary Clinton has said that, that she would do. She said, this is a good deal, 
but Iran poses a lot of other problems and we need to counter Iran in those other areas. And I think whether you support the deal or not, I, I think it's clear that we do need to keep the pressure on Iran for combating terrorism and other interests in the region. Uh, I can take a few more questions. Matt has to, I get, have to get him to another appointment at 3.30 elsewhere on campus, but, um, so I have to keep an eye on the clock. So we'll take a couple more questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to get back to Israel. Um, one problem, uh, recently there was this attempt to make a, a, a nuclear-free Middle East, and uh, Israel has at least 40 nuclear bombs. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is in the Middle East, there's absolutely no mad. And until the time you can have a, a nuclear-free Middle East, this makes Iran very, very problematic in reaching an understanding. Yeah. So we're going to take a few questions at a time, or should no. I? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are a number of nuclear weapons-free zones in, in other uh, parts of the world. There's one in Latin America. Uh, there have been proposals for a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East for some time. Uh, major problem with that, of course, is that Israel has had nuclear weapons, we think, since 1967. And the estimates are, you know, uh, public estimates. I'm sorry? At least 40. Yeah, around you know, 100 or 150 or sometimes the estimates you see. So, um, so part of the problem with these proposals is you know, stopping a country from getting nuclear weapons is hard enough, as we see with Iran. Getting a country that already has a fairly large stockpile, who believes that that stockpile has been critical to their security, and getting them to give that up uh, is even more difficult. So I'm, um, you know, I'm a non-proliferation expert. I'm in this field because I think the spread of nuclear weapons is, is a problem. So. Personally, and I think a lot of people would disagree with me on this, but personally, I think it would be great if, if Israel didn't have nuclear weapons. Just in practice, I don't see uh, any way of, of how we do that. You know, um, he's uh, uh, pretty controversial, but uh, John Bolton, uh, the, the former ambassador to the UN, um, was on Jon Stewart a few years ago, and he, and he had a funny line. Um, he said, because uh, Jon Stewart was talking about the spread of nuclear weapons and how it's a problem, and um, you know how we should, I think John Stewart said we should just have global zero, Obama's right, we should get rid of them everywhere. And John Bolton said, well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not that different from you. You think that zero countries should have nuclear weapons, and I, I, on, I only want one country to have nuclear weapons. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think it is something that on which kind of Democrats, Republicans, liberal, conservative, hawks, doves uh, agree that, it, you know, we might disagree over nuclear weapons in the United States, but I think we all basically agree that nuclear weapons in other countries is, is a problem. Yeah. Right, thank you. Um, I see that this might be an argument a lot softer than the ones that have been brought up before, but sure. do you not see um, the this deal as a means of possible change of, uh, well, a possible means of changing domestic um, politics in Iran? Should we really give up any hope that Iranians will get rid of their um, government so to, and replace it by one that is actually not as aggressive as this one? Um, I mean, 15 years is a long time um, in this respect. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So many people who focus on Iranian domestic politics are excited about this deal because this regime has been able to maintain power for so long uh, and that maybe this will shake things up enough to, you know, maybe if uh, trade increases with Iran, um, maybe that that will empower um, other forces outside of the government who have more economic power. Maybe it'll uh, bring in more outside ideas and other things that might weaken uh, the current regime. Uh, so that's, of, of course, uh, possible, and I think that would be wonderful if that happened. Um, but I think also in foreign policy, you have to have priorities. And uh, so I, you know, I think it would be wonderful if there were a better government uh, in Iran. I think the first priority has to be stopping uh, nuclear, the spread of nuclear weapons, uh, which is, poses more of a direct threat, I think. Um, and so I th I, the way I see it there, there is something of a trade-off, that I think this deal maybe would lead to change in Iran, um, but maybe not. You know, it's a pretty big, you know, if you're, if your argument for the deal is, you know, this is going to, to lead to a, a more democratic Iran that's going to give up the program, I mean, that's a pretty big gamble. You know, maybe, maybe it does, but, 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 but um, maybe it doesn't. And at the end of the day, you know, um, Dennis Ross, who's a longtime uh, advisor on Middle East issues for both Republican and Democratic administrations. Also from Berkeley. Oh, is that right? <laughs> Berkeley PhD? Or I didn't know that. Uh, no, UCLA, but he worked here. Oh, okay. Um, well, you know, he, he said that the, the problem in Iran is that, um, because it's often pointed out that there are all these young people who are more pro-Western, uh, who don't like the current government. Uh, and, and Ross's line on this is, is the problem is the current government's willing to kill to stay in power, 
and those people aren't willing to die to take it. Um, and so as long as that's true, um, it seems like it could be problematic, but who knows, maybe the deal will shake things up. I know there are a lot of people in the room who would like to come up and say hello to Matt personally afterwards, and I do have to get him on his next meeting at 3.30, so I'm just going to take one more question. And I'm sorry for those of you who don't get to ask the question, perhaps you can approach uh, afterwards. Well, and I, I am, you. Um, uh, you can email me too, uh, matthew.cranig at uh, georgetown.edu, so I'd be happy to take questions that way. You mentioned toward the end of your initial talk that uh, there's a scenario that if a Republican is elected president, they might withdraw from the agreement and move sanctions back into place. Okay. But in light of your answer to the earlier question about sanctions, would that have much meaning? Would that be easy to accomplish because of the fact that if other P5 countries uh, keep their sanctions pulled back, that would give Iran the economic muscle that it needs. And uh, you also mentioned that the uh, domestic interests in this country would be resistant to sanctions, secondary or tertiary sanctions. So is that a realistic idea? Yeah. So uh, good question. And um uh, so clearly, if you wanted to kind of stay on the pressure track that, that I was advocating, it would be better to have just stayed there rather than doing a deal for a while and then going back. It does make it more complicated because in the interim, there will be companies and, and countries that go in and contracts signed uh, that you have to tear up. So I think, I think it is realistic because, as I, I mentioned before uh, in my meetings uh, abroad, these countries have said, if you give us a choice between Iran or the U.S., we'll, we'll choose you. But it will be difficult um, if, if contracts are signed. So I think part of what uh, the Republican candidates uh, sh should be doing is to make it, uh, as, as they kind of are, but maybe they could even make it more clear about their sincere intention to do this in 18 months and maybe even explicitly say, you know, foreign companies, foreign firms, you're, or, you know, you're thinking about doing business with Iran, but there's a 50-50 chance one of us will be elected. There's a 50-50 chance in 18 months uh, that sanctions are going back into place. So you might want to, to think about this. You know, maybe there's an opportunity here, but um, there's, there's a good chance that uh, you're going to be in a tough spot in 18 months. And so I think if they make that case, then uh, there will be less uh, business interest rushing into Iran immediately, and it will make it slightly easier to, to reverse in the future. Uh, but it's certainly more difficult to go back and forth. Before we adjourn, let me again say that George Perkovich will be here on September 28th to give uh, more of the same with a different angle on this. So let me encourage you to come back, um, be here early so that you get a seat. <laughs> In the meantime, please, let's thank Matt for a superb presentation. My pleasure.